Hey everyone, welcome back to another Factual Fingers episode. My name is Brock. Today I'm going to be reading a short story on the No Sleep subreddit. This story is by Sylvester Spoolie. The story is called, Somebody has been leaving notes around my house. They're starting to freak me out. They started out innocently enough. Don't forget your keys. Read the first message. Scrolled on a sticky note in loopy letters. It had been left on my fridge door. It immediately grabbed my attention, because at that time I lived alone. I had no memory of writing it, and the handwriting didn't match mine or anyone I knew. I was slightly perturbed, but wasn't sure how to react. In the end, I just tossed the note and went to work. The second note came a few days later, left on my kitchen counter. The sticky note was pink this time, but still had the same distinctive loopy handwriting. Make sure to pack your lunch today. Again, I was unsettled. Now, any normal person might have reported this to the police, but during that time I was going through a major depressive spell. I had moved to a new city, away from my friends and family, and had started a new job that I quickly realised I hated, and didn't nearly pay enough. Home was lonely, and work was soul crushing. I had enough trouble getting out of bed each morning, let alone filing a report that I'm sure the police would not take seriously. Even more stressed, I crumpled up the note. However, I ended up packing a small lunch for myself. Usually I didn't bother to put the effort in and just ate cafeteria food, but against my better judgement, I fulfilled the wishes of the note. That day, the cafeteria was closed. The main cafeteria fridge had broken overnight and many of the frozen lunches inside had gone bad. Management thought it would be better to shut it down for the day. A feeling of unease settled in my stomach after learning the news. It was as if the note had predicted it. The notes continued throughout the following weeks. They would typically show up on random days, no more than three notes a day. They were all left in obvious places in my apartment, all on sticky notes and in that unfamiliar, loopy handwriting. They began to grow more prophetic. Take 180 today. It will be a bad accident on your way home. Janet is going to offer you some cookies at the office. Politely decline. They will give you food poisoning. Marie has been on a diet. Compliment her on her weight loss. She'll end up thinking well of you. Of course, I tested the notes to see if they were accurate. Every time I ignored their advice, whatever it warned against came true. One day, a note said to pack an umbrella, and I purposely didn't. It was forecasted to be sunny that day, so any normal person wouldn't think to pack one. But sure enough, I got soaked that evening walking to my car. I was incredibly curious about the notes. There were so many questions I had about them, and those unanswered questions kept festering in my head. I tried writing notes back in return and leaving them out, but never got a response. I'd speak out loud and ask questions as if, or in case, the note writer could somehow hear me, but this only made me feel foolish. I'd occasionally make a surprise visit home at odd hours just to see if I could catch the note writer leaving their notes. Of course, I never caught them. I tried installing cameras in my apartment, even making sure all of the cameras were completely hidden. But the next day, I found every single one of the cameras insides completely torn out and placed on the kitchen table, with a single note next to them reading, Never do that again. The notes stopped coming after that, which made me deeply regretful. I had grown accustomed to the notes. I had begun to rely on them even. They had significantly improved my way of life over the last few months, both mentally, financially, and socially. I had actually started making friends at the office thanks to their advice, and for the first time in my life, I was even a bit popular. My managers, who before the notes didn't pay much interest in me, now valued my presence and would ask for my opinion on projects. It was no secret I was on my way to a promotion. Could I still do that without the notes? I also valued the notes as a friend, as weird as that sounds, or more like a guardian angel. Wherever they were from, they were always protecting me. Without them, the future was suddenly unknown, dangerous. Every time some mild annoyance popped up from that point, from bad traffic to stressful work situations and even a minor paper cut, I thought about how all this probably could have been avoided if I still had the notes. 
The next week, a bright green sticky note appeared on my bathroom mirror. Don't forget to call mum today. It is her birthday. I nearly cried. I decided to sack my investigation and just accept things how they were. Slowly, the fog of my depressive spell began to lift, and I could feel myself returning to how I used to be. My confidence rose, and for the first time in a while, I felt equilibrium with my life. I went out, cracked jokes, and even managed to clean up my apartment. I also managed to get a girlfriend somehow. Her name was Amanda. I met her at a pub when I was out with some friends. The best part of all this is that for some reason she seemed to actually be into me. She was gorgeous, way out of my league really, with long hair that reached down to her back, with soft brown eyes. Her laugh was lovely and the lemon scented perfume she liked to wear was intoxicating. She was the type of girl you could chat with for hours and never run out of things to talk about. The relationship was still new so I was trying not to plan our whole future together in my head. But she was so lovable, it was so hard not to. At some point, I briefly thought about telling her about the notes. I've always wanted to tell someone about it, but never really had anyone to tell up until now. I decided not to, however, afraid she might think I was crazy. There was no point so early in the relationship making her think I was a loon. Plus, I was afraid the notes might stop again. If whoever was leaving them clearly didn't want me looking into them, how would they react if I shared what was happening with somebody? So at the moment, I kept it to myself. Amanda had a hobby of cooking, and had invited me to her house on a Saturday for, in her words, the best fucking spaghetti you'll ever eat. I was pumped, since this was the first time I would actually visit her house. I was in a good mood that evening. As I was getting ready for the date, I hummed to myself happily, thinking about how lovely this was going to be and I went downstairs to grab my keys. On the kitchen counter was a new hot pink sticky note. I picked it up instinctively. Kill your girlfriend. My brain stopped for a moment. I read it once, twice, a third time. The words flashing in my brain, but hitting an error every time. I set the note down and gulped, feeling nauseous. Anxiously, I went to my car and started driving. I tried not to think about the note, but the words kept circling in my mind. Kill your girlfriend. The notes had never failed me before, and they were always in my best interest as far as I knew, which was adamantly not much. Maybe they were wrong this time? Maybe it wasn't meant to be taken literally. Kill could be a synonym for breakup, right? My mind kept trying to make up poor excuses the whole way there. By the time I arrived, I was a sweaty mess, and not a lick calmer. I pulled down my sun visor to check my face, and a bright green sticky note flooded out. I went cold. The notes had never appeared outside my house before. Hand shaking, I picked up the note and read it. Kill Amanda. Take the gun from your glove box and shoot her. I looked at my glove box, wide-eyed. I did indeed keep a handgun in my glove box for safety purposes. I wanted to puke, to believe this wasn't happening. Again, I ignored the note and walked up to Amanda's house, trying to shake the message from my mind. She answered the door almost immediately after I rang the doorbell. Hey, what's up? She said with a bright smile. When she saw my face, the smile dropped. You okay, Gary? What's wrong? She said in concern. Nothing, I lied, trying to force a smile. Well, actually, I think I have a bit of a stomach ache. Come in, come in, she said, ushering me in. The inside of her house was cute and homely, and she fretted over me worriedly as she led me over to her kitchen table. She then took my hand and rubbed it comfortingly. If you're not feeling up to spaghetti, we can always have it another time. Don't worry about it. Do you want any antacide or something? I smiled. The way she was so concerned for me over a simple stomach ache made me fall in love with her all over again. My heart panged with both love and guilt. The aroma of cooked spaghetti was extremely strong, and even though she said it was fine, I knew it was probably going to be a bummer for her to pack away all the spaghetti after just making it. 
I'm fine, sweetie. I probably have a stomach ache because I haven't eaten much today. I was looking forward so much for your spaghetti. Her smile returned again. I always loved how far she smiled at things. Well then, Mr. Hungry, let me grab you a bowl. She left for the kitchen. I reclined back and sighed, sticking my hand in my pocket. I felt a crinkle of paper. Shit. Shit. I pulled the paper out of my pocket. Take your chair and bash her head in. I had a hard time controlling my breathing as I stuffed the note back in my right pocket. I also felt paper in my left pocket, and against my mind screaming for me not to, I pulled it out, realizing that it was actually two notes crinked together. Shakily, I unwrinkled the first note. Do not eat the spaghetti. Drugged. What's that, Gary? asked Amanda behind me. I nearly jumped out of my skin. I stuffed the note back in my left pocket. Oh, just some note from work I forgot was in my pocket is all. I said in a weird voice. She frowned. Looked like she wanted to say something, but then thought better of it. Here, babe, she said gently, handing me a bowl of spaghetti. It looked heavenly. I wanted to puke. She sat next to me with her own bowl. She rested her head in her hands and looked at me excitedly. I stared at her blankly. Well, take a bite, she said, gesturing towards my bowl. I, uh, I'm sorry, I really need to use the bathroom. I jumped up and started looking for her bathroom. She jumped up after me, looking confused. Gary, what's wrong? You've been acting weird. When I found the right door, I went in and locked the door behind me. She kept knocking and knocking. Gary, Gary, seriously, what's wrong with you? Is it the stomach ache? Is it that bad? Talk to me, Gary, please. I backed up against the bathroom wall, then sank down to the floor. I pulled out the notes from my left pocket again, this time reading the second note. My heart sank. She is not Amanda.